Hey, happy Wednesday, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well this evening. I do know that uh, there's a lot of people that are um, feeling a bit under the weather right now. So we are definitely going to be praying for you guys. And as a church, we're not only going to be praying, but we're going to be doing everything we can to be as cautious as we can, but yet remain as faithful as we can. Because uh, I know, I know that God is going to be with you. He's going to be with us. He's walking with us through all of this mess and uh, we're just believing that um, God is not finished with this, that he still has his hand right in the midst of it, and that he's protecting, he's watching over, and he's going to be with us in a very special way. He's going to be with you, all of you who are not feeling well. Maybe uh, maybe you even got a bad report, and, and uh, the doctor says, uh-oh, it's, it's COVID. Uh, well, I know that God is with you, and I know that uh, our prayers, our thoughts, and anything we can possibly do, I can do for you. We're there with you and for you as well. So for all of us who are just hanging on and, and uh, trying to avoid as best as we can, I hope you're doing well. I hope all of us are growing closer to the Lord every single day. Uh, I know I say that a lot, but you know what? In my opinion, if you've gone through the day and you haven't grown closer to the Lord, it's, it's a bit of a wasted day. And I know that God has given us new mercy every single day. And it's for that main reason of leaving all the, the, the stuff behind, all the sin and all the things that would try to hinder us from getting closer to him and really focusing on that and, and really living that life he's called us to live and loving the people he's, he's calling us to love and being an example of his grace and his mercy. And um, I, know that, I know that God is with you as you do that. Um, I'm hoping and praying that you are, that, that maybe through this year, which has not been the easiest year, that you are growing closer to the Lord because that is what is going to take you through the rest of it. So, all right. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, we are, we're it. We're, we're at the end. We're at the Revelation chapter 22. This is it. You have held on. You have made it through most, some of you may not have ever read entirely through the book of Revelation. And that's actually why, one of the reasons why I did teach this the way that I taught this is that uh, if, if you followed along with me, you read every single word of the book of Revelation. And that is important. It's important because at the very beginning, and we'll find out at the very end that um, there is a blessing and a promise attached to every single word here in the book of Revelation, a blessing to, to all of those that are, are adhering their life to this prophecy and to these words that we have read. And so, hey, just expect it. You're going to be blessed. In one way or another, you are going to be extremely blessed because you have gone through every single word with us. So I appreciate all of you that have. Thank you for all of, the, uh, all of those, all of you that have joined in Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday and listened to this Bible study. Man, we love you. We appreciate you. Uh, you're, you're the reason why we do this. You're the reason why uh, why I get up in the morning and I do what God's called me to do. Um, I, I thank you. I really do. I appreciate you uh, taking your time and, and uh, watching this. And, and I hope that you really have gotten a lot out of this Bible study. It has been a long one. It's been a lengthy one, but I hope it has encouraged you. And uh, I hope that uh, you really got the big message through all of the book of Revelation. And that is, the, that is this, that Christ is in control. That Christ has all of this in his hand. He's got all of this foreordained. He's got all of this then worked out according to the plan. And this is how we know we can take scriptures to heart and, and, and build our life upon them. Such scriptures as... He works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. We can take those types of scriptures and we can hold on to that and we can be blessed by that because we know Christ has a plan. And no matter how dark it may seem from time to time, Christ is the light at the end of that tunnel. We're actually going to read about that light, that light that is going to fill up in, in the entirety of heaven that light that's going to be given to us and that light that we're going to reign in. Uh, we're going to have a good time today in Revelation chapter 22. So without further ado, get your Bible, get your pen, get your paper, get your highlighter, get all that good stuff going. 
and let's turn to the book of Revelation chapter 22. Um, I call this and title this Joy to the World. You'll see here in just a minute why I entitled this lesson Joy to the World. Before we get deep into this lesson, let's pray. Let's come together, you and me and we, and let's come together. Let's be the church. Let's pray for one another. Let's ask God's will to be done, not just in this Bible study, but in all things that we are involved in, in all things that we're doing. I really believe God wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. So give it all to him. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. You are so good. You are so full of mercy and so full of grace that is never ending and always abounding. That where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Thank you for your goodness. Not just a goodness that you hold to yourself, but through the work of your son, Jesus Christ, and the work of the Holy Spirit, you are giving that goodness out to all of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Pray, God, that we would seek your face more and more every day, that we would grow closer to you. I pray, Lord, your anointing that is on this word be upon every word that I speak tonight, a, a, an anointing that goes forward and takes light to, to break the darkness and break the chains that would bind people. Set at liberty those who are captive. Touch those who are sick. Be with those, God, that are struggling mentally, socially, uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually. I pray, God, that you be with them that are struggling and that you, through this word, give them strength. Let strength rise up in their spirit to be who you've called them to be, to see you at, your, at, at the clearest we possibly can. Father, we love you and we thank you. You are good. Bless all of those that are sick, especially those that are sick with, with COVID. We pray a protection upon them that they would recover fully and quickly. And we pray, God, that you would just stop this COVID in its tracks. We give this to you. We, we ask that you take the lead and we'll follow. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen and amen. Good to have everybody. Glad that you've joined in on this final Bible study in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22. Um, we are going to not have a big Bible study next Wednesday because I do know a lot of people will be getting things ready for Thanksgiving or maybe even already doing some family stuff if you possibly can do that. I would encourage all of those to do that as much as you possibly and safely can. Uh, that's really important this time of year. So as best as you possibly can, try to do that, but be safe and be smart about it. Um, next Wednesday, I'm just going to post a brief video about thankfulness. It may It's going to be brief, but it will be very powerful. Some things God's been dealing with me about being thankful, especially during this time of year and especially this year in general. 2020 has not been an easy one, but God's been with us every step of the way. So we're going to take a moment and be thankful for that. It won't take up much of your time, but I do. I will ask you to, to join in at the same time at 6.30 next Wednesday for a a shorter video about thankfulness. Maybe it'll put your heart and your mind in the right mindset for this time of year. So uh, anyways, Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is right on our doorstep. I know some of you that excites and some of you that makes you cringe. Hey, I'm a big kid at heart, so I love Christmas. I love this time of year. Um, uh, I've entitled this Bible study, Joy to the World. And here is why. Um, in 1719, a man by the name of Isaac Watts, who was known as a, a Christian hymnologist, or at least he, he had written a lot of Christian hymns, hundreds of Christian hymns. Some you may not know, some you may, like uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, he, he had penned that. Well, he was one day reflecting on Psalm 98, and we're not going to read that. You can go in your notes, write it down, and, and read it later. But he was reflecting on Psalm 98, and he had pinned um, just his meditation and his thoughts down in a poem that, uh, that was a reaction to what he thought about and what he felt there in Psalm 98. And um, he didn't mean for this to be a popular song, but... 
Uh, he just meant to be this reflection of Jesus Christ and his power and his glory reigning forever throughout all of the earth. We sing it here at Christmas. In fact, it is, you know, as of even late 20th century, the most popular Christmas hymn in America. We sing it a lot at Christmas, but it was never really meant to make us think about Jesus coming the first time. This was really penned as a result of thinking about him coming the second time and his second coming. And most of us would think, well, what does that have to do with Christmas and why do we sing it here at Christmas? Um, well, maybe it has more to do with Christmas than we realize because you can't have a second coming without a first coming. And we are going to read about, in Revelation 22, we're going to read about his identity, Jesus um, giving us a clear picture of his identity here at the end. And so um, I, I want to read to you just a little bit of joy to the world, uh, just to kind of get us in that mood, get us in that spirit uh, of his second coming, that the first coming reminds us that maybe the first time he came as a meek and humble baby laid in a manger where there was no room in the inn. Uh, but the second time he comes, he comes in glory. He comes in splendor. He comes in power. He comes in grace. He comes in love. He comes in light. He comes victorious as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. And it goes on to say and make us meditate on wonders and wonders of his love. And really, that is the incredible thread that ties all of the book of Revelation together. It is the wonders of his glory, his power, and his righteousness all done in love. And I know some of us may, may think and have a hard time wrestling with that thought that, wait a minute, there's some, some pretty crazy stuff going in Revelation. Why would that be representative of his love and well we got to remember this that not only has he given us a couple thousand years in that love to turn to him but also we also got to recognize that that he has done all of these things to lead us unto the day in which we will live with him forever in that beautiful city we read about last week and in that beautiful style of life and living that we read about and studied and talked about last week and that and, and we may have to go through a dark time to get there, but his love has promised that there will always be and that there he will reign and we will reign with him. This is the culmination, if you will, the, the last chapter, the culmination of that love and that purpose. And John gets this, doesn't just get a glimpse. You know, he's been writing for now 21 chapters He's, he's been writing not just little glimpses, little types and little shadows about what is to come. He's been witnessing it and envisioning it, walking through it, worshiping through it, going through it in full color. In living color, he's been walking this, this revelation, this prophecy out. And I believe that that is for the major reason of of his children, those of us who, who are going to be reading this years later, that we can read this and we can see in living color what he saw and that this is not just totally made up by man's interpretation of what things will be like. This is it. This is 
this is what Jesus wanted him to see, that it is real, it is true, it is rich, it is beautiful. And you can go back and read this again, and you can see some of the exact things that heaven is going to be about and eternity is going to be about. Revelation chapter 22 Let's start reading at verse one. In fact, I'm probably going to do like I did last week. I just want to read the entire um, chapter, and then we'll go back and dive into certain things and aspects that I want to pull out for you. So, but I want you to get just the, the grand splendor of Revelation 22 and how, remember Revelation 21, we talked about that new city, that city of Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven and being upon earth and, and he calls it the new heaven and the new earth and that city becomes the major hub of all of life and existence now on the new earth. That's like, if you will, the capital city of the entire earth. We talked about how big it is and how, how beautiful and how grand it's going to be. And so with Revelation 21, we talked about the, the hub, the center of the entire earth. Well, now we're going to talk about the center of of the center, the main focal point of all life that will exist, especially in you and I and those who are believers for all of eternity. Let's talk about that. Revelation 22, starting at verse one. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They shall need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Boy, if that's not a central theme to this entire book, I don't know what is. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral, immoral and murderers and idolaters and those who loves, those whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. For whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, 
If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And he who testifies to these, th to these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And the final verse, which I think is so fitting, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And I think that's appropriate for all of us right now, maybe in heart, maybe out loud, to say, Amen. Revelation chapter 22 is, um, it, it's obviously not just the culmination of everything coming together. But it starts off by giving us the central focus of that central city, New Jerusalem, that all of the world will be focused on at that time, that all of life comes from this new city, this new Jerusalem here in this new earth. All of us with our new glorified bodies all receiving uh, light and life from this city. But I think it is so appropriate that we end with the focal point of that holy city and the focal point being the throne, the throne of God, the throne of the Lamb, and the river of living water flowing from that. Uh, this river of living water is not like any other water that we know. This is, this is not like ocean water or even a fresh stream um, or, or even a, a mighty river that we would think of here in the earth. It is more pure and more fresh and more clear than any of that. And at any time, those who are thirsty will come to this and it will drink. This water is so, so full of life that the Bible says that it is the center of the city, that, it, that the throne is the center of the center. And then from that flowing through the city, is this river of life. And on each side of that river are the trees of life. Uh, the trees of life who have therapeutic properties and healing properties in the very leaves itself. Now, that, that we don't exactly know what that means. Uh, we don't know if that means, hey, we can eat a salad and be healed. I, I don't know. Maybe that's okay as long as we have some holy ranch dressing to pour over that. Um, but it says that these leaves are therapeutic and healing for all of the nations. Um, it goes deeper to say that, um, that there are fruits that are bore from these trees and actually 12 different fruits that, or, or at least every season, every month gets another fruit. We, we say 12, it may not necessarily be 12. It just means that in every season, in every different season, there's going to be a new fruit that's there that we can eat of freely. Now, this is reminiscent of, obviously, the tree of life that was found in the book of Genesis. And um, when they, of course, Adam and Eve, uh, messed up and were banned from ever eating from this fruit again, uh, fruit again there was then a curse placed in Revelation chapter 3, a curse placed on Adam and Eve, and, and it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And that curse being that not only could you not eat of that tree of life anymore, but now by the sweat of your brow you must eat, and you must labor, and you must work. And, and now there's going to be a death waiting for you. Um, but now this curse that we read, this curse is broken. The curse we read about in Genesis is completely broken for everyone there for all eternity here in the book of Revelation chapter 22. Everybody praise God that curse will be broken. And for those of us that have eaten of the tree of life of Jesus Christ hanging on a tree or a cross for us, you know, when Jesus said, hey, take this, eat and remember that this is my body broken for you. What that means is that he was broken for us so that that curse could be broken. The curse 
that was found in the flesh of man was broken when Christ allowed his flesh to be broken upon a tree, upon a cross, so that we may eat of him and the fruit of what he did for us on the cross so that we can have life forevermore. This river of life that proceeds from the throne gives life forever because he's the source of this life. There's, there's no source like a pond or a, or a melting ice cap or something like that. This source is living and this source is forever. One of the greatest promises found in, in the first five verses is not just the fact that the, the throne is the center, not just the fact that from that throne flows rivers of, a, a river of living water, and not just the fact that there are trees of life surrounding that, that we can eat of freely anytime we want to. But the great, one of the greatest promises which makes heaven heaven, which makes this eternity so full of glory, is the fact that verse 4 says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Imagine that, getting to see the face of God that we are completely surrounded by the holiness of God in our glorified bodies that he has given to us in full righteousness. And because of that, we get the opportunity to see him face to face, to, to look at the expression of love in his face and to see the fire in his eyes that he burn, that burns for, with passion for you and for me in that relationship, that, that we don't have to get words of God by secondhand knowledge. We can receive fully the, the word of God from his own mouth. We have a need, we have, a, we, we have something that we want discussed, or we have a question, we come to him and receive that word completely, fully. That answer is not going to be an interpreted answer. That answer is going to be a given answer that we can live the rest of eternity on. And with that, we begin to know him as he knows us. How incredible is that? To know him as he knows. He knows every hair that is on our head. Some of us have more to count than others. But, but he knows every hair on our head. He knows every fiber of our being. He knows what he's created us to be. He, he wove us together. He knows, uh, he knows us at a DNA level. He knows us so intimate, so deep. And yet, now in this setting, we get to know him as intimate and deeply as he knows us. How incredible is that? You know, I've heard it said that if you could have all of, all of the things that you think you want in heaven, like uh, eternal life and joy and peace and love and no pain and no sorrow, no suffering, um, all your body completely being glorified and fixed and getting to be with your loved ones and your friends and your family and those that have gone before and getting to have no stress, no worry, but peace for eternity. If you could have all of that stuff and have it without the presence of Jesus Christ, without the presence of God on his throne, would it still be heaven to you? Obviously, my answer is no. And as beautiful and as great as all of that stuff sounds, you know, he's the source of all of that stuff. So there, there really isn't any of those other things without the source, without him being there, the source of this river of living water flowing freely from his throne to all of those who thirst. You know, I'm reminded of Jesus when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness they shall be filled. Righteousness meaning a right standing relationship with Jesus. Righteousness doesn't mean just physical blessings or, or, or the ability to, to think that you're perfect or, or that you don't struggle. Um, it's the ability to have a right standing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a pretty cool picture to be right standing with him because I don't deserve to be right standing with him. We deserve to be kneeled down with our face on the floor before his feet. 
washing his feet with our tears, singing, singing songs from our heart to him without being able to see his face. But that's not where we end. It is the picture of we may begin with washing, our, washing his feet with our tears, but the end is that he picks us up, pulls us in, wipes the tears from our eyes so that we can clearly see him face to face. What a joy, what an honor, what a privilege. So from this river of life, basically it flows into the entirety of earth. And if you will, if you want to look at it this way, it restores Eden. Just the same as it was when Adam and Eve had this relationship with Christ to walk in the garden, this, this place called Eden, um, it has now been restored. The rest of the world, because of this flow, has been uh, restored to be a, a place of paradise, uh, an Edenic place of paradise that we get to also experience and live in for all of eternity. How incredible is that? That also with this Edenic paradise, um, we get a new type of purpose and work. Um, it, it's not the type of work and, and purpose that we think we have down here where we got to get up, got to go to work so we can make some money so we can pay some bills. Um, it's a completely different and entire, entirely different purpose and existence and way of living. We get to have a, a, a new and glorious purpose to serve Christ in a way we're, in which we reign with him forever over this paradise. So we move from these first five verses about this focal point, this this, this life that flows from the throne into a message, a message given kind of back and forth to John from an angel and also from Christ himself. And this message, um, first that comes from the angel and then next by Christ himself, um, this message is uh, basically saying that these things that you have written, these things that you have experienced throughout all of these other chapters that we have discussed, they are faithful and they are true. And the angel asks him, don't seal this book up. Now that's pretty significant because when we read about uh, prophetic things and uh, about the end times in the Old Testament, like Daniel and Isaiah and those, those kind of things, Ezekiel, oftentimes um, the angel would tell Daniel, now seal this book up, shut this book up for a later time. Well, in this case, the angel says, don't shut this book up, that this is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophets and all the things, the types and shadows that they had seen, you're seeing in living color. So don't shut that book up. Keep it open. Now, he wants it to be kept open for a very important purpose, and that is so that you and I can meditate, read, and live by these prophetic words. What do you mean read or live by these prophetic words? Um, that is exactly what Jesus says whenever he steps up and says, Behold, I come quickly. We read in verse 7, uh, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy in this book. I want this book to be open because I want people to know that I come quickly. And that doesn't necessarily mean in a span of time. For instance, a lot of people, this is, throws them off when they realize that John wrote this, you know, a couple thousand years ago, almost. And Jesus said, then he comes quickly. Why are we still waiting? Well, first of all, we're still waiting. And you better praise God that we're still waiting because he is still pouring out his grace and his mercy. Now, you're probably like me. And you're probably looking at 2020 and you're hoping that at the stroke of midnight on December the 31st, at the beginning of New Year's, you are probably hoping that he'll split the sky and call us all home and let's not ever have another year like this. You know what? As, as much as I would love myself to see that happen, I also can't be very selfish that if God still has a work and a plan 
if God still has a purpose for this world to be here, and if God is still in the process of building his kingdom now, uh, whether that process is going to continue another year, five years, 50 years, 150 years, we don't know. So I can't be so self-centered on this and just ask God, who take me out of all of this mess because I'm tired of it all. Um, what I must be is focused, just like what we were just talking about, focused on him and the life that flows from him and use this this example of of the way in which the world is living now and the things that we're going through to to be used by him to build his kingdom. So until that time comes and when he does come, it is going to be so quick. Now, I will admit that prophetically speaking, there are a lot of very quick things happening right now. The dominoes are falling faster and faster every single day, every single even minute that we're in existence. And we are absolutely drawing closer to that time. But at the same time, that means that if we are drawing closer to that time, then you and I better get busy and we better start living this gospel even more so with those that are around us because we don't have time to play. Uh, Playtime is over. It's time to get real. It's time to get right. And it's time to spread this gospel to as many people as we possibly can because we want everybody to be in on this, not just you and not just I, but everybody. So this message from the angel and Jesus himself coming together saying, don't seal this book. I'm coming quickly. It's it's going to happen. It's inevitable. Here it comes. So live like this is coming quickly. Uh, live your life like this is on the horizon. Live your life like this is the direction in which you are going in. Live your life like this is the direction that all of the kingdom of God is moving in. And you and I being a part of that, that's the direction we are going. We are heading that direction. So we got to take as many as we can. And as we live that way, the Bible says we are blessed uh, Jesus Christ himself says you are blessed by living that way, living in the accordance of this prophecy that not only is he going to reign, but he's reigning now and he's moving all of this forward. You are blessed by that. The word blessed means to be envied. Um, are you living in, in such a way that you are full enough of God, that you're so full of the presence of God in your life that people around you that are sitting in darkness can look at you and say, how is it that you have the life that you have? And then that's where we point to say, it's not my life, it's not me, it, it's Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and who he is in my life. And that gives us an opportunity to share this blessing with others. Now, with this message and this prophecy, Jesus also takes a, a, a brief moment to do something also very important. Obviously, everything he does is important, right? He does everything with purpose and power and importance. Um, but in this, he also, after he speaks of his coming, he then speaks of his identity, and he says a few different things. Number one, in verse 13, he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first. I'm the last. And we know those as Greek letters, and uh, we know that all of the words that they use were made up of letters, and so all of the thoughts and the things that they would then translate from a thought life by using words and getting it out into the world. Um, it, it's all done by letters and letters arranged into words and words arranged into sentences. And then those sentences are then um, portrayed out into the world to almost become real in the minds and hearts of other people. Well, Jesus is reminding us he is the living word of God that, that formed and framed the earth in the book of Genesis and put all things in order through his spoken word, as if he is saying that his spoken word has the power within its own self to make reality happen. And so he's saying, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the source of this reality that you're going to see in, in all of heaven and all of eternity. I'm this, this wellspring. I'm, I'm the well that will never run dry. I'm this river of living life. I, I, I'm, I'm the one who, who sat at the well 
and waited for the woman from Samaria to come who was seeking for life from many different husbands. And Jesus says, no, being married to me as the, as the bride of Christ, there is where you find the true source of life that you are looking for. He's saying, I'm the alpha, I'm the beginning, I'm the source of all of that. And he says, and I'm the omega, which means I'm the end. Now, that's that's really cool for us to think because there is now then no end because he's always living. He will always be living. He's always been in existence and he always will be in existence. He is the end. And if he's not dead and he's alive and alive forevermore, then our end is found only in him and nothing else. And so we have a promise. We have a promise that um, he has no end. So therefore, those of us found in him, we have no end either. He goes on to say he's the root and the offspring of David. And that's pretty, that's pretty interesting that he would call himself at the end of everything, the root and the offspring of David. Now, obviously, he's speaking to a predominantly Jewish a group of people that became the beginning of the, the Christian church and then, of course, spread on out to the rest of the world. But um, the, the Jewish people then in that day were looking for this Messiah to come and sit upon the throne of David and reign in that throne forever and therefore allow them to reign with him as his people. Um, so Jesus says, I'm the root and the offspring of David, as if to say that I am the source and the deity that gave David the divinic line and the messianic line that you are looking for. I'm the one that David sprang up from me in the beginning, in the first place. I am the source of the power that David had to sit on his throne. Remember, David was a man after my own heart. And so if David recognized me as the source, then therefore everybody else, especially my people, God's people, should recognize me as the root and the source of this messianic power, reigning power, that's going to sit upon the throne of David for all of eternity. He also calls himself, though, the offspring of David, as if to say he recognizes that there is a, a humanity to this and that he allowed himself to be born into humanity so that he could die for humanity, then live again for humanity in a glorified body that was still fully full of, of spirit and full of humanity so that all of us as humanity and image bearers of Christ have this this joy of being able to know that we are going to live forever. We are going to live forever, not just as floating spirits or, or orbs or balls of light, um, not, not, just some, not just in some state or type of, of, of mind of nirvana, uh, but we are going to live fully and purposefully in the glory and the glorious body that he has for us. He is the offspring. He's the one that through the Davidic line will sit upon the throne of David in the New Jerusalem, which is called the city of David forever. Then we move from this. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go over one more. He says he calls himself the bright and morning star. Uh, the, the bright and morning star is, is pretty significant because he's talking about himself being the light um, the bright morning star is that brightest star, some would dare say the sun, um, that announces that the arrival of the day has come. And Jesus is saying, I'm announcing to you now that the arrival of the day of me reigning is here. So live your life in a way that I reign over your life. And that, that means your, your past doesn't reign over your life. Your sickness doesn't reign over your life. Your anxiety, your worries, your doubts, your fears, your sins, none of that reigns over, over your life. He does. He reigns. And he shall reign forever and ever. So we move from that now into where I was going a few seconds ago into a both a blessing and a warning. 
Um, this blessing and this warning where Jesus and the angel both testify to say, you're blessed if you live by these words. But I'm warning you, if you take these words and you twist them, if you try to twist the prophecy of Christ reigning forever, if you try to twist this prophecy of, of him ordaining all things to his glory and working all things out and, and being the one who will be the victor over evil, if, if, if you twist the fact that he will be on his throne forever and ever, if you twist it in a way where you make it about anything else other than him, then you're missing the point and you're actually falling in danger of being the other part of this book that we read where the 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 chastisement the plagues the the judgments and all the that went against the people that were not people of God that's where you are in danger of being but if you hold fast to your faith and the testimony and the blood of the lamb then this book is for you and this blessing is for you and then we come to the end and in a way I'm excited at this end in a way I'm kind of sad because I've been so enjoyed um, sharing uh, all of the book of Revelation with you and everything that God has allowed me through his grace to know and understand but here we are at the end and we're at the end and it's so fitly so so greatly comes to this last verse and I want to read this this last verse one more time in fact if there is uh, if you're like me and you, you want to try to memorize more scripture and to meditate on more scripture then here's a great one to meditate on you could do Genesis 1 1 in the beginning was God and then you could do Revelation 22 and 21, the last verse. And boy, if you could memorize both of those two things and pull them together, you have already accomplished a lot. Revelation 22, 21 says, Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I love how he says, Amen. Amen, as if so let it be done in accordance with, with your will. So let it be done. So be it. Let it all be done. You've spoken it. You've said it. Now may the, the sound that goes forward, may it begin to pierce the darkness. May it begin to form the, the chaos of, of our life into this promise that we are going to see and be a part of this eternal living and existence with God. Let it be done. Work it all out. Move by your hand. Move by your will. Move by your glory. Move by your power. Move by your spirit. Let it be done. Let everything that needs to fall into place fall in place. Let it be done in accordance with your will. Jesus Christ himself says, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And he even ends that scripture with amen or that, that um, prayer, the Lord's prayer with amen. Amen. You know, there's not really much more to say other than amen. <laughs> Meditate on that. Be still in that. Be still and know that he is God in the amen, in his amen, that his will is going to be done. Um, I pray a lot of times, God, your will being done. And, and uh, what I also mean with that is that, Lord, you would align my life Line it up underneath your will being done, underneath the headship and the lordship of you and of what you're doing in this day, in this time, and in this world. When we pray, Lord, thy will be done in our life, just as Christ was praying in the garden, thy will be done, not mine, but thy will be done, that we are aligning ourselves saying, God, I know that your will is going to be accomplished and going forward, um, but I want to be a part of that. I want to align myself under that. The, the anointing in the Old Testament always flowed 
on whoever was anointed from the head down. They would anoint the head, and uh, the Bible says they would anoint it so much that it would overflow the beard and flow on down into the rest of the garments. So what that means is that the head is anointed to bring this to pass, the head being Jesus Christ. Now it's up to the body to pull yourself in, pull yourself underneath the anointing, let his anointing flow over you, and let it be done. Amen. Amen. I'm reminded uh, as I close of a song that uh, I've always thought was kind of fun to listen to and when nobody's around, fun to sing. Um, but it's the song by Jester Hairston, who had written this in 1963. He was an American composer and he had written this this um, this song for a, I believe it was a film of that day. But it has since become pretty popular in the um, hymns of the church. And that song is entitled simply, Amen. I'm not going to sing it to you, but you can, you can YouTube it, Google it. Jester Hairston, Amen. I do, however, have the lyrics that are printed up. And uh, the way that the song is, if you've never heard it, the way that the song goes is that it is a story of the life of Jesus Christ. And it actually begins with him being born in a manger. And then it moves throughout the story of his life. Um, as the, him, Mr. Hairston, the composer, sings one part of that, of that uh, stanza, then the chorus or the, the, the choir repeats back to him, amen. As if he has said, here's the story you say amen to go along with that. Here's the story. The choir sings amen to go on, go along with that. Uh, let me just read some of this to you. It says, see the little baby. The choir sings amen. Wrapped in a manger. Amen. On Christmas morning. Amen. 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 See him in the temple. Amen. Talking with the elders, amen. Who marvels at his, wit, at, at his wisdom, amen, amen, amen. Then they sing into a big chorus of amen over and over a few times. We go into the second verse. It says that, see him at the Jordan, amen. Where John was baptizing, amen. And saving all sinners, amen, amen, amen. See him at the seaside, amen talking to the fishermen, amen, and making them disciples. And obviously, amen comes after that. Verse 3 says, Marching in Jerusalem, amen, over palm branches given to him, amen, in pomp and in splendor, amen. And then it takes a turn to see him at the garden. And how even in that toughest time, we can still say, amen, praying, to his Father in deepest sorrow. Amen. But I love the last verse that says, He was led to Pilate. Amen. Then they crucified him. Amen. But he rose on Easter. Amen. Amen. And amen, hallelujah, amen. He died to save us, amen. And he lives forever. Amen, amen, amen. That is important because just as this song says, the story of Jesus was not only incredible, not only miraculous and triumphant, not only full of, of both humility and splendor, but the story of Jesus Christ never ended. It still is going on. It's still living. It's still powerful. It's still living in you and I. It's still living in our faith. It's still living in our belief. It's still living in our being still and knowing that He is God. It's still living in us spreading His gospel. It's still living in the way that we live our life. And you know what else? It's still literally living forever because He reigns and lives forever and ever. Joy 
to the world. Amen. His story has no end. Father God, we love you and we thank you. God, in you we find not just a hope for today, but a hope for eternity. In you we see a light, not just for this day, but a light for all of eternity. In you we see the answers to our prayers and the source of life in which we can drink from every day throughout all of eternity. Father, for all of us who sometimes get caught up in the temporal, I pray, God, that you turn our eyes, turn our eyes on the everlasting. For all of us, God, who is in just a, a midst of darkness, I pray, Lord, that the darkness would begin to tremble because the light at the end of the tunnel is coming and is coming in such a way in which we are all going to say, Amen. Lord, for those who need to live their life in a way that is pleasing to you and honorable to you, I pray, God, that they give you their life today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we say, Amen. God bless you. We love you. We're here for you. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Uh, like this, share this, get this message out. Help us, especially in now, which we're having to do things a little differently again with the church. We want to keep being the church and we want to actually, we, I'm believing, I am so believing that as much struggle that the church is going through, we're actually going to grow through all of this. And you are a blessing by being here. You're a blessing by giving. You're a blessing by watching. You're a blessing by being part of our family, which is why we call Rock. We call it Rock Creek Family Church. You're part of our family. We love you. We're here for you. If there's anything we can do, let us know. We're praying for you. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday evening. Hopefully, I'll see you Sunday. Peace out.